What lies beyond our solar system, hiding in the far reaches of the cosmos? Alien planets populated by strange life forms? Ancient ruins hiding supernatural knowledge? Doomed space stations floating in the void? Many video games try to give these places form, letting players experience a vast array of possible universes firsthand. Some inspire awe at the mysteries of the cosmos, and others with terror of the unknown. But there's one series whose vision of outer space has drawn players in for almost 40 years. One that invites us to explore a galaxy full of strange worlds, deadly creatures, and numinous mysteries through the eyes of a stoic bounty hunter named Samus Aran. The Metroid series has accomplished a lot in the last 37 years. Many Metroid games are regarded as some of the best in the medium. The series even inspired a subgenre that's fueled the indie development scene for years and it's helped broaden video game speedrunning into a thriving cross-platform community. The most recent release, Metroid Dread, has sold more than any other game in the series prior. Metroid Prime Remastered triumphantly resurrected one of the best games of all time, and many of the series' best games are easily available on the Nintendo Switch. And now, with rumors of new games and the looming promise of Metroid Prime 4 on the horizon, it's easy to look at the Metroid series in 2023 and see a successful franchise brimming with as much potential as any other Nintendo property. But it wasn't always this way. Metroid has seen many triumphs for the last 37 years, yet Samus' adventures struggle to sell anything close to her green and red clad cousins, and the series often goes dormant for many years at a time. It's a fascinating story and one I've wanted to cover ever since I started this channel, but I was never quite sure how. Many others have reported on Metroid's story, and in some cases, it's been told directly by Metroid's developers. But there's another side to this tale that often goes overlooked. The story of the passionate community that often waits years for these few fleeting hours we get to spend exploring alien worlds and surviving on derelict space stations. The people for whom Metroid is more than just a video game series. So, I reached out to game developers, journalists, and figures in the Metroid community to help tell Metroid's history from their perspective, and to share why this series of sci-fi action-adventure games is so important to us and to this medium we all love so much. This is how Metroid saved the galaxy. In the mid-1980s, Nintendo was the new global king of video gaming, largely thanks to hits like Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda on the NES and Famicom. The company's name was even synonymous with the medium in North America. Following these successes, the Nintendo Research and Development 1 team began working on a new side-scrolling action title, Metroid. Led by producer Gunpei Yokoi, creator of the Game & Watch and later Game Boy, the Nintendo R&D One team sought to create something that differed from Nintendo's other games by melding the 2D side-scrolling view of platformers like Mario and Mega Man with non-linear player-driven exploration similar to Zelda. Unlike the family-friendly adventures Nintendo was known for, R&D One drew inspiration from Ridley Scott's 1979 horror film Alien when designing Metroid's protagonist, the power suit-clad bounty hunter Samus Aran, and the many creatures she encounters throughout her mission on the remote alien planet, Zebus. To underscore this darker sci-fi theme, the game's composer, the now legendary Hip Tanaka, made the soundtrack and sound effects intentionally unsettling. The result was a unique game that looked, sounded, and played unlike anything else when it launched for the Famicom in 1986 and the NES in 1987. I think my favorite game in the Metroid series would have to be the original Metroid. That title screen opens with music like you've never even heard on that. And then just the fade in with Samus fading in and then just the sound bits like the Samus fanfare sound bit. That first sequence, that first thing that you have to do getting the morph ball, how the game kind of forces you to go back and look at the starting area if you just ran to the right. It's just very clever. Everything just kind of comes together to have a game that looks as old as it does and at first kind of feels as old as it does, open up 
and kind of tickle all of those things that you want from an exploration game and to give you that feeling of getting stronger and like the physical sense rather than a leveling up sense. I just had a lot of fun with it and it really pulled me in and there's something about just the black backgrounds and the colorful sort of corridors and like the darkness of the game. I, I don't know, I just uh, swept me off my feet. My favorite moment from a Metroid game is actually from the very first one and it's when you enter Kraid's Lair because the Kraid's Lair theme on NES I think is just the epitome of Metroid music. That sort of, you know, that It's creepy. It suggests there's something like hiding under the surface. It's very mysterious. I love that too. To me, like that tune is Metroid. Metroid 1 is fascinating, you know, especially in comparison to everything else that it was contemporary with um, and coming out of first party Nintendo. Like it's so, it's throwing so much of the conventional design wisdom of the time out the window in favor of just trying stuff. And some of that stuff doesn't work and I think it's better for it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Metroid 1 is maybe the most uh, like easy to get lost and confused and turned around in and full of the most like NES era. How was I supposed to figure that out stuff? Um, but it's just so cool, man. Playing Metroid for the very first time in the year 2006 was interesting. I got lost immediately, I didn't quite know where I was going, and there was no direction. You could ignore the long beam and just go in a, in a totally different corridor and find something entirely different and have all these enemies swarm you and defeat you and you spawn with 30 health again. It was a very tough game to navigate and to play. You couldn't aim diagonally, you could only aim up and right, you couldn't even duck to shoot. It was a really tough game to get into and I don't think that really hooked me on the Metroid series probably wasn't the best first impression. As time has gone on though, I have really grown to love the first Metroid. There's just something so fascinating about its open design. You can fight Ridley or Kraid in any order you want, and it's so cool that you can just go around the world and find these little secrets that are scattered in a non-linear order. And that's the beauty of the Metroid series. It's always about discovering things for yourself, but the first game in particular really doubles down on that, and it's something that I really admire today. The original Metroid received high critical praise, especially in North America. However, Samus wouldn't see a follow-up adventure until 1991, with Metroid 2 Return of Samus on the original Game Boy. Once again developed by the Nintendo Research and Development 1 team, Metroid 2 took the sprawling side-scrolling adventure and compacted it down to fit on the Game Boy, resulting in a much more linear level structure compared to the original. Instead of the non-linear labyrinths of Planet Zebus, Metroid 2 sees Samus descend into the caverns of SR388, the home planet of the Metroids, on a mission to eradicate the species. So the first Metroid game I played probably the weirdest one to play first, and it's uh, Metroid 2 on the original Game Boy. I remember just being over at, at a friend's house and their older brother had it, and I sort of messed around. I remember that uh, <laughs> the older brother got really mad at me because I apparently backtracked to a point where like he didn't know where he was <laughs> on the map or something like that. But that was technically the first Metroid I ever played. Yeah, I think that was the first, uh first actual Metroid game that I owned and like dumped a lot of my own time into. Metroid 2 was definitely um, simplified by comparison. There's a lot of sparseness to it, um, a lot of blank backgrounds. This big empty kind of passively hostile space to the point that it's kind of uh, bordering on directionless. I was at my local video rental store where they also rented Game Boy games for some reason. And I remember very distinctly seeing the box art for Metroid 2 Samus Returns and thinking, oh my God, this is a cool space game where you can play as a robot, um, which was very important to me as a kid. Cut to me taking that game home and completely not being able to understand it because I was about six years old. Um, it was pretty obtuse and pretty difficult. 
And uh, despite the fact that I really loved what I thought the series was going to be, um, I just couldn't figure out how to play it at all. Metroid 2 features a much darker scenario than the original Metroid, putting Samus in the role of genocidal exterminator rather than galactic savior, and Metroid 2's atmosphere reflects this change appropriately. The soundtrack starts heroic and bombastic, but warps into an eerie and minimalist ambience as you delve deeper into the planet. Metroid 2's sprites were also much larger than the originals, showing off more detail in Samus's power suit and the many alien life forms she encounters under SR388 surface. However, they took up large portions of the Game Boy's screen, making navigation difficult and underscores the game's sense of forlorn isolation. Yeah, it's not a lot of not a lot of space pirates and Ridleys there that are like actively seeking to harm you so much as just like the flora and fauna of a place that are just kind of there doing their own thing and you're kind of the invasive species in that sense um as sam is running around and like yeah there are a bazillion metroids in that game they need to hunt down like that's the whole point of metroid 2 is um you know exploring that map and hunting down all of the individual metroids there but uh for the most part the quote-unquote enemies and stuff in that game are just they're they're just the stuff that lives there already you know it's not like Dread, uh, where you have enemies that are actively trying to, uh, you know, uh, find you and harm you. It's just like, this is just a dangerous place to be. It's a great dungeon crawler. It's just turning wizardry into an action game and rotating the camera from first person to third person. But like, it's still a 2D plane. It's just on the side. Yeah, anyway. Metroid NES and Metroid 2 Return of Samus eventually received remakes, both official and unofficial, that many fans considered superior to the originals. However, I, and many others, still think these games are worth playing, offering unique experiences that are unlike any other Metroid game, whether that be Metroid 1's open-ended structure or Samus Returns' claustrophobic atmosphere that their remakes just can't match. I like those remakes enough. I do like both of those original games more, though, because of those reasons. Following Metroid 2, the Nintendo R&D One team started working on the third game in the series, one that would bring major changes, both in-game and behind the scenes, and that introduced a new generation of fans to the power suit clad heroine. I first discovered Metroid when I was a little kid. Uh, my mom and dad would record uh, The Simpsons on VHS, and during the commercial breaks, uh, I would watch all these various video game commercials growing up and one of them was Super Metroid uh, where the guy takes the dog and locks it up into the test chamber while it's playing Super Metroid and goes from like a Doberman to like a Chihuahua. Um, so I remember that commercial sticking in the back of my mind. I borrowed a stack of Nintendo Powers from a cousin and it happened to be during the run of issues where they were serializing a Super Metroid comic. Uh, I was immediately drawn to this purple-haired science fiction superhero uh, who reminded me of two purple-haired characters who were running around in the X-Men comics at the time. Uh, I was a little shocked to learn years later that Samus is actually canonically blonde, but she'll always have purple hair to me. I discovered the Metroid series by accident. So what used to happen is every Saturday my dad used to take my brother and I to the video game shop to hire out a game and so this particular week we chose Super Metroid and I was just floored by it. It was, it was so amazing. I was totally immersed in the exploration, the isolation, the soundtrack and bear in mind that it was in 1994, I was seven years old so I didn't understand sequence breaking and speed running but despite that I was still fully immersed in that game and I loved it. Super Metroid was the first game in the series written and directed by Yoshio Sakamoto, who previously worked as an artist on Metroid NES and Metroid 2. It was also the first to feature composers Kenji Yamamoto and Mina Kohamano, who would go on to write music for many future Metroid titles. Super Metroid picks up immediately after Metroid 2, with Samus delivering the baby Metroid to Federation scientists on the Ceres space station, leading to one of the most memorable opening sequences in any video game. 
My favorite moment from a Metroid game is actually the opening to Super Metroid. I think that is so incredibly effective. It gives you a little text scroll at the beginning to sort of set the stage, but then you are on this base, you find all the scientists are dead. It's a Nintendo game. It's a first party Nintendo game. The start screen has dead bodies on it. Like, it's wild. It's very spooky, very haunting. You finally find the baby Metroid and then boom, you're in a boss fight, which is totally unexpected. You don't even know, you know, how to play the game yet because you've just started and I, I know in my case, I was constantly afraid I was going to die before the game had even started. And then that amazing countdown and escape sequence. And then you get into the actual game proper and it's just such a stark contrast of just standing there in silence with the rain pouring down and having grown up in the rain capital of the world my entire life. Like that just spoke to me um, really heavily to be uh, just kind of awash in that kind of atmosphere, but to have that atmosphere feel so directly intentional. You know, going through Sarah Station and then like down onto the uh, abandoned surface of planet Zebus before the space pirates make themselves known and everything. I don't think I could have asked for a better introduction to this series and what it was capable of, not only in terms of how the game is laid out, how it's paced, how it's structured and everything like that, but also how it can suck you into its universe and just envelop you in this palpable atmosphere. There was really nothing else that I had played that reminded me of that experience. It was incredibly unique and I'm really, really happy that that is the game that I started with. Rather than revert back to a fully open-ended design of the original Metroid, or the strictly linear structure of Metroid 2, Super Metroid balances aspects of both, offering a large world to explore with clear goals and progression, but without ever telling the player where to go or what to do next. There's these memorable images throughout the game, like your gunship sitting out in the rain, that are just burned in my mind forever. It didn't feel like such a slog to go backtracking through everything. Uh, it was actually a lot of fun to just focus on exploring this huge game world. Uh, I'd never experienced anything like that in a video game before. There's an early section of, of Super Metroid where there are these like skull faces all around and you may not even like stop to think that is a skull face and that is creepy. It just, it might be subconscious. The entire time you're playing, you're like, this is kind of uncomfortable and I really like it. And that makes sense because you're exploring a different planet. At the beginning of Super Metroid, when you find uh, the Morph Ball, that I think is really powerful because up until that point, if you'd never played a Metroidvania before, you are probably just like, okay, this is like an action platformer, whatever. But when you find that first unlock, then that's when it clicks. And that's what is like at the heart of the series. And that moment of like, oh, now I can get to those areas from before, that's just a, such a powerful moment early on in super metroid uh you can get stuck pretty easily when you 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 don't know where to go and this certainly happened for me where i was wandering around for a while trying to figure out what my next move was and you get to that point where you just start trying everything everywhere right so you're just shooting missiles in every room bam 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 bam, bam or you're you know uh setting down bombs all over the place and the super bomb in the one specific glass tunnel that breaks the glass tunnel and you fall through to a new area and it unlocks the rest of the map. Like that sense of discovery, that aha moment is so, so perfect. Such a perfect encapsulation of what Metroid games are all about. What other game do you know at the time was doing that? Like, oh, you break this section by using an ability that you get that don't tell you that you can do that with. It's unheard of. Even the Metroidvania games that have come so far are not able to match that moment. And there are great Metroidvanias too, but nothing quite like, nothing quite like Super Metroid. I love how sort of subtle and simple the storytelling is while still giving you a story and sort of an emotional hook to hang on to. Uh, getting the hyper beam at the end of Super Metroid, that's like everything I want out of a boss fight. Uh, this incredible boss fight against um, Mother Brain where Samus is about to die, be defeated by uh, Mother Brain. And then the baby Metroid, all grown up, shows up, comes over and saves Samus, blocks the attack, and 
fills up all of her health and basically gives her hyper beam, makes her incredibly powerful. And after that moment, uh, Mother Brain kills the baby Metroid. And it's like kind of sad because the Metroid gets killed, but you get to see, you get this new power to kill the final boss, and then it ends in the best way a Metroid game can end. You've got to get out of there before the place explodes, and you're just running out of there. It's a clock ticking down. It's like a, it's like a mad dash to the finish. Great ending. Great way to close that game out. In terms of aesthetics, I think it just holds up so incredibly well as a game. And just the bosses, the different worlds and levels that you're experiencing are all just really top notch. And it gives a great sort of lonely feeling as you're going through the game. It wasn't until uh, 2022 that we actually played Super Metroid. And after completing it, I have to say that it's now my favorite Metroid. It's, 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 it's a masterpiece and now I can see why. Super Metroid is one of the greatest games of all time, bar none. Don't even need to state the reasons why. It's just a, it's a gold standard of video gaming, period. Super Metroid is definitely the high watermark, and I don't think I'm just saying that out of nostalgia. Which isn't to say that I think the game is necessarily uh, absolute perfection to such an extent that it will never be topped, but so far, no one's done it yet. For me, at least, for what I come to that series for, uh, Super Metroid still feels like kind of the embodiment of everything that works so well about Metroid. So there's a reason that every GDQ ends with some kind of like, you know, four-way Super Metroid race or something, um, and, you know, donation incentives for saving and killing animals. Like it's, it's become a big old meme on its own um, for sure, but I, it's one of those rare cases where I think it's kind of earned it, you know. After Super Metroid, the series went dormant for many years. In fact, Nintendo's next home console, the Nintendo 64, had no Metroid game of its own. Nevertheless, the N64 was where many fans first encountered Samus Aran thanks to her appearance in one of the console's most popular titles. I first discovered the Metroid series uh, probably the same way as a lot of other people. Uh, with Super Smash Brothers, Super Smash Brothers, Super Smash Brothers, Super Smash Bros, Super Smash Brothers, Super Smash Brothers, Super Smash Brothers, Smash 64. I had never seen or heard of Samus before. Uh, I had a Super Nintendo growing up as well as an NES, but I had never seen or played Metroid on NES, and I had never played or seen Super Metroid. There was really something interesting about an orange-clad kind of quiet warrior type who could also charge giant energy blast and look cool in a spacesuit. I was always so gravitated towards Samus. Just seemed like such a cool robotic character. It had these laser beams and missiles and bombs. I always wanted to play as them. Although I didn't know anything about them. I didn't even know that Samus was a woman. Uh, she had a really difficult stage with lava that came up and burned me alive. Um, it was also my first fighting game. So my introduction to Samus was pretty brutal if I'm being really honest. Melee was just a couple years after the original Smash, and there was a lot more to see of Samus's world in Melee. We had multiple stages, different characters in the backgrounds, different songs, and a bit more robust uh, moveset that really just clued into how badass of a person Samus is. Samus remains a staple of the Smash Brothers roster throughout its sequels, and Metroid's presence in the franchise would only grow, with new fighters like Zero Suit Samus, Dark Samus, and even Ridley joining the pool of playable characters, and new stages, support trophies, and other easter eggs showing up in each subsequent Smash Brothers game. In November 2002, Samus' story finally resumed with the dual release of Metroid Prime on GameCube and Metroid Fusion on Game Boy Advance. Both games launched in North America on the same day, a bold move that seemed to signal Nintendo was taking Metroid seriously. The dual release proved to be a wise move, as having two all-new Metroid games available on Nintendo's latest handheld and home console introduced yet another new wave of fans to the franchise. Advertisements for both games dominated video game magazines, TV, and the burgeoning online gaming press and demo kiosks popped up in electronic sections in malls and department stores that gave players their first taste of Metroid in over eight years. I remember 
I first played uh, Metroid in a Walmart, like on a little kiosk demo thing. Um, and it was Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance. And I just remember like being so shocked at, at what that game was doing. I uh, hadn't played anything like that up until that point. But I remember like turning into a morph ball and going through the doors and stuff and like finding new areas. I just had never experienced anything like that. The, the, the sort of um, ambient, uh, like weird tone that the game had. I, at me as like a little eight year old, I was just like, this is weird and cool and I like it, but I don't know what to make of this. I don't know what to do. So my story with the Metroid series begins Christmas day, 2002. I unwrapped the Metroid Fusion strategy guide. Not this specific copy of it, but this was it. And I only unwrapped the strategy guide. There was no game with it. Um, it was kind of a promissory note that later in a few days, I would get the, uh, the, the game. So I spent multiple days just pouring through this strategy guide, looking at the art, looking at you know Samus's cool suit, drawing all the monsters. So yeah, I mean, that's probably why I, I love the series as much as I do is because of that strategy guide. Um, and of course I played it, you know, a few days later when I actually finally got the game. But uh, yeah, that strategy guide and the art and just it, everything about it was just so, so cool. And it just captured my imagination so much. And that's what got me started on this whole thing. With Metroid Fusion, director Yoshio Sakamoto and his team pushed the series even further into sci-fi horror, opting for a more cinematic experience and drastically evolving Samus' design and capabilities. The game also introduced a new threat to the galaxy, the deadly X-Parasite, a gelatinous mutating organism that infects, kills, then copies its hosts. The opening moments of Fusion turn Metroid's mythology on its head, with Samus nearly dying as she's infected with the X-Parasite on the surface of SR388, only to be saved by infusing her with Metroid DNA. In effect, she's become the last known living Metroid. Not only did this add more narrative weight to Samus' story in Fusion, but it also gave the development team the freedom to change Metroid's gameplay, altering everything from Samus' mobility and weapons to how players traverse and explore the abandoned BSL space station. I remember when Metroid Fusion and Metroid Prime both came out uh, on the same day. I didn't have a GameCube at the time, but I had my Game Boy Advance. Something about Fusion really caught my attention. I love everything from the color scheme, like the Fusion suit and like the blues and like these, these bright colors in it. The whole design, just something about it looked really cool. I remember thinking of like how fast and fluid that Samus looked in this game. And my little exposure to like the original Metroid game, it just always looked like a very stiff game. You know, I know it was like an older game on an older console, but something about Fusion looked very quick and very fluid. Um, I mean, even just looking at the jump between Super Metroid and Fusion, um, like Fusion places a much higher emphasis on, uh, on the fragility of Samus, but also on like mobility um, and uh, it's a very fast and snappy game with like mantling and the platforming and stuff. It's also a lot uh, talkier. There's a lot more exposition going on. The computer tells Samus in the game clearly, this is your objective. Here's where you're going. It's all laid out for you. And I think as someone who was new to the series, that was really helpful. Having that clear path, you know, I think that helped a lot, especially as someone who had never played the other games before. Um, there's, It's more direct about it's like horror influences with the SAX and everything. The first time the SAX shows up in the game, there's a moment where you see what you think is Samus or a clone of Samus in the traditional uh, outfit from the other Metroid games. You're in the fusion suit and you hear the footsteps of this clone-like character walking around. Something's stalking you now. Like you're being hunted. You're investigating everything, but this other thing that has your suit, your capabilities, your movement, it can go where you can go. You're being hunted by this thing. Throughout the game, you have this encounter, and in one of them, you're on a platform above SAX, and you see it walking underneath you. And as you hear it leave the room, my first thought in the game was, do I want to drop down here and go out this door and have this fight or not? Uh, there's even parts in the game where the computer tells you, you don't have the right equipment for this fight. If you see this, you need to run. Like, they're telling you in the game, don't fight it. You've got to run. I was really surprised by kind of the tension in the game. It felt like a survival horror game, 
on the Game Boy Advance. Like before, uh, a Dead Space, you know, it felt like a survival horror game in space. And I was really surprised at how well this small portable game uh, fully immersed me into a lot of moments of like genuine fear and tension. Fusion would lead me to get interested in Zero Mission, which came out later. As someone who never played the original game, Zero Mission was the next uh, Metroid that I jumped into. And I thought it was a, a great one to, to follow up Fusion with. Three years after Fusion, Sakamoto and the R&D One team once again tackled a 2D Metroid adventure. But rather than continuing on from the events of Metroid Fusion, Nintendo opted to remake the original NES Metroid on Game Boy Advance with Metroid Zero Mission. While Zero Mission follows the same narrative as the original, it is a much more directed experience. It's not as linear as Fusion, but is instead closer to Super Metroid's structure. The game would also feature new art direction, a remix soundtrack, and faster, smoother controls that felt comparable to Fusion's. Along with these changes, Zero Mission also added new locations like Kozodia, new mini-bosses, new power-ups, and an all-new epilogue sequence. I think Zero Mission is just a perfect example of a remake done right. It takes everything that was good in the original version of that game and improves upon it tenfold. Um, the exploration, the discovery, the locomotion, the boss fights, like everything about Zero Mission is incredible. And it's a game that is insanely replayable. It's so much fun to fire that game up and just blast through it. While Zero Mission is highly regarded among fans, it didn't sell nearly as well as Fusion. And so fans would have to wait several years before seeing a new 2D Metroid game. But the Metroid series was still alive and well elsewhere, just in a very different form on an entirely different Nintendo console. On November 18th, 2002, Metroid Prime released alongside Metroid Fusion. Developed by Retro Studios in Austin, Texas, and overseen by producers Kensuke Tanabe and Shigeru Miyamoto, Metroid Prime reimagined Metroid as a first-person game. At the time, Prime's first-person perspective and fully 3D environments represented a drastic new take on the Metroid formula. Obvious comparisons were made to Microsoft's wildly popular sci-fi shooter at the time, Halo Combat Evolved. On the other hand, Metroid Fusion's 2D side-scrolling seemed to maintain the series' traditional gameplay. In hindsight, it's almost completely the opposite, with Fusion focusing on more linear, narrative-focused gameplay, while Prime stuck closely to the principles of isolation and exploration that defined earlier Metroid titles, and featured a storyline set between the events of Metroid NES and Metroid 2 that felt closer in tone and substance to those earlier Metroid titles than Fusion's. In fact, in some ways, Prime's new first-person perspective clarified the unsettling sci-fi atmosphere previous Metroids could only hint at, and deepened the sense of immersion for players. I got Metroid Prime for the GameCube, and I remember playing it late Christmas night after the family Christmas party, and uh, it scared me bad. <laughs> I'm not a first-person shooter kind of guy, and the settings and the theme were, were pretty scary for my, my easily frightened self back then. It had a distinctive atmosphere that freaked me out, and I thought, is this like a horror game? I remember landing on Frigate Orpheon for the first time, and I just remember the fire and all the dead bodies, and it's a really dark opening, specifically for a Nintendo game. It was really frightening, isolating. Um, the main boss battle freaked me out, but after getting into the groove a little bit, I got into it. Uh, even as a little kid, I was um, I was really vibing with it. After you escape the pirate frigate and you land on Talon 4, and then you just hear this sweeping music, this wonderful rendition of the original Metroid theme playing out as you just ascend onto this world, the soft rain just drizzling over the, the world, and you just feel like there is a majesty to this place. It builds a sense of respect for the place that you are about to spend the rest of the game exploring. And it really builds this intimacy that you have with the location that you're in. And I really, really love that. And I don't know if there's another Metroid moment that quite tops it. 
The opening moments on the planet really mirror Super Metroid because it is a kind of grassy plain with lots of rocky terrain and it's raining. They literally open the same way. I never played Super Metroid, so all, all the references to Super Metroid I didn't really get the first time around. Uh, so it was a little bit off-putting hearing like, you know, like this really awesome like uh, uh, ID, IDM, like industrial music, and then you get to like uh, Talon Overworld and all of a sudden you hear the trumpets and stuff and it's like, you know, such a whiplash. But once I understood where the game was coming from and the, the lineage and everything, I, I can really appreciate the nods to the older titles in the game. I've replayed the game no less than a dozen times over the years, and each playthrough really does have something different that I can enjoy and take apart. Like when Fog overtakes Samus' visor and you can see a reflection, or you see the static from electric-based enemies that can mess with the screen. I, I think it really adds the atmosphere. Watching the rain bounce off of Samus' arm cannon, um, seeing... Uh, her like fingers in a different configuration with the x-ray goggles on flashes of light and explosions would like reflect her face on the visor for a second little things like that that place you in a space are my favorite things about metroid in general and i think the 2d ones have to abstract that stuff a little bit more um because you are more directly controlling an avatar on the screen in a place that you see a lot more of at a glance because it's a side scrolling view um, but, uh, whereas Prime is more, you know, kind of traditionally modern first person game stuff where you are inhabiting a body and exploring a place much more directly in that sense. And I think both of them achieve that feeling in very different ways and it requires a very different approach to get there. I think Metroid Prime is masterclass in terms of how to transform a treasured 2D series into a 3D perspective, especially going as far as to change the perspective uh, to first person, which I, I imagine, and I was not a Metroid fan at the time, but I imagine that was quite polarizing for people going into the game. Nobody could have predicted that a first person shooter would be able to maintain that sense of solitude and exploration. And I really think it's the, some of those things that really make it just a perfect Metroid game in my eyes. NES Metroid, Metroid 2, and Super Metroid had a feeling of isolation that I think is very distinct than what you'll find in Metroid Prime. Because with those games, you have a very limited scope in terms of your narrative. You have very little information going into those experiences. And for the most part, you don't have any kind of text-based interaction with the game at all. With Metroid Prime, you have the ability to scan the environment with Samus's visor. She can obtain information on land masses or you know, physical elements of the environment, enemies, uh, computers, logs. You can get information from space pirates or the inhabitants of these uh, areas of the planet. The scanning system allows you to like learn more about the lore while also learning the weak points of the boss. It's instead of like, uh, for example, like a Legend of Zelda game, Ocarina of Time, when you, when you uh, Z-targeted on a boss, you had Navi tell you what you have to do to beat that boss. Like, oh, the weak point is this, that, or the other. Metroid Prime, you don't have you don't have someone telling you, you just have to look for it, but also you have to look for that stuff in the world as well. One of my favorite examples is the space pirate logs refer to Samus as the hunter and how much they fear her. Uh, playing the game, they seem more like incoherent monsters, but they do have intelligence. It's weird how that just made you feel more powerful just by reading how these creatures feared you like that. I thought that was really interesting how uh, it gave me perspective of myself as I played the game. I really think it's Metroid Prime I have to thank for taking my time, exploring areas, and just kind of scanning everything because it was such an intrinsic part of Metroid Prime that it's just something I kind of carried over to other games going forward. I, I am that type of guy to just kind of putz around and just explore. One moment that's always really stuck with me in uh, the Metroid series is getting the spider ball in Metroid Prime, seeing the spider tracks throughout the course of the game in a 3D environment. You know that eventually you're going to get that item and figure out how to navigate those paths. But the way that the spider ball opens up that world is just phenomenal. Like some of the spider ball puzzles, some of the rooms that are completely reimagined once you have the spider ball. Um, I just remember getting that item and feeling like, wow, I have uncovered an entire 
different side of this game. Like there's so much more to this game than I even anticipated. And it kind of goes back to that aha moment that I was talking about earlier, where it's like, yeah, okay, here it is. I have the item. Now I can unlock all of these secrets that I didn't have access to previously. I get the same feeling from Breath of the Wild where you're exploring the environment and you see ruins, you see towns that are no longer there. Seeing what could have been with a lot of these areas makes you feel more alone than you would have otherwise. Seeing Fendrana just for the first time, that's when I really fell in love with the game. Like, you exit the elevator for the first time and you hear the music. It's such a mystifying, unique sound to that, that, that little hallway. And then you exit and compared to everything else you've done, it's been kind of terrifying. There's been, you've been going through lava caves and ruins with ghosts in them and exploring these lost and forgotten areas with wildlife that wants to kill you at every turn. And then you enter Fendrana Drifts and it's so snowy, the music so peaceful. The piano just kind of flutters as you see the snow falling. For that time in gaming, the expanse looks so broad and the first time you enter there, you see Ridley flying across that giant shadow that uh, hovers right over you when, as Ridley flies across. That's so distinctively memorable to me as well. I'm just like, this is a different kind of game, man. This is something that I've never played before, and, and I'm here for it till the end. It has such amazing exploration, the isolation, the story, the music, and the soundtrack. It's just crazy good. On top of that, I have a special attachment to it because when my mother died of cancer, I used it as a coping mechanism to, to get through a difficult time. A lot of my friends and other acquaintances had used alcohol and drugs to try and get through tough times and they ended up falling down the rabbit hole. Um, and I wanted to, wanted to avoid that at all costs. So I will always have a a small appreciation for Metroid Prime. I mean, the devs worked 100 hours plus to get that game out the door. They sacrificed a lot of their lives for it. And I don't know if I'd be here today if, if not for that game. So I, I will always have a fond attachment to it. I love the devs. If I could, I'd take them all out to dinner to show them my appreciation for it. But yeah, Metroid Prime will always be my favorite. I can't see any other game ever beating it. Prime's new gameplay direction would pay off for Retro Studios and Nintendo. Not only is Prime often considered one of the best games in the series, it's often ranked as one of the best games ever made, period. And for almost two decades, it stood as the best-selling game in the series until it was finally dethroned by Metroid Dread almost 20 years later. Metroid Prime's success naturally spurred Nintendo and Retro to immediately begin work on a sequel. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes launched on GameCube in November 2004, two years after the original Prime. Rather than simply repeat Prime's formula or retread common Metroid tropes like the Chozo and Ridley, Retro instead pushed the Metroid series into new territory, introducing all new civilizations and planets to the Metroid lore, new power-ups for Samus, and all new gameplay concepts. The most drastic of these new elements was a dimensional hopping mechanic where players used portals to hop between light and dark versions of the planet Aether in order to progress the story, which sees Samus aiding an alien race called the Luminoth in their fight against a new villain the Phazon corrupted Dark Samus, and her army of bug-like Ying. These new enemies would be smarter and deadlier than anything players fought in Prime, and even the environment itself was far more hostile to the player. While divisive among some fans and critics, these changes made Prime 2 a more dangerous and unsettling adventure compared to the first. So one of the questions I asked people for this documentary was to tell me about their favorite memories or their favorite moments from a Metroid game. and. For me, even though I would say that, you know, Metroid Prime is probably my favorite game just of all time and that Metroid Fusion was really the game, you know, that I got started with, the moment that I think about the most from the Metroid series is in Metroid Prime 2, the opening of Metroid Prime 2. It's definitely the most like atmospheric and creepiest parts of the game, but it's probably just the most horror movie-esque moment in the entire Metroid series, in my opinion. So Samus makes her way down to the surface and she's investigating 
reports of a missing Federation Marine group. And basically, and appropriately enough, it plays out like a scene from Aliens. Samus comes upon their corpses and you're scanning them. And you just find out that they get, they just massacred by some sort of weird uh, alien bug creatures. And as you're exploring these abandoned caves and uh, hallways, you start to see evidence of Phazon. And this weird black shadowy stuff starts infesting not just the bugs, but the marine corpses as well. And they start getting up and they're like reanimated zombies and they're shooting at Samus. And it's the first time in the Metroid series that it really goes like supernatural horror because so much of Metroid is based on like body horror and just like psychological weird space stuff. But this is like full on like ghosts and zombies and, and things like that. And it gets really dark and really brutal. And yeah, that moment is just so deeply affecting and weird and, and scary, and I, I love it so much. I'm, I'm one of those those Echoes creeps, those echo sickos. Um, I love that game, man. I'm from the school of brain worms that uh, is very much in favor of inconveniencing the player like all the time. Um, so I love the way that um, huge swaths of Metroid Prime 2 would just... Uh, it, the air was just corrosive, you know, um, like just standing here is slowly draining your health bar kind of thing. And it like, makes you think about the space in a very, very different way. And um, the way that they had little bubbles on timers that would allow you to catch your breath for a minute, but you still have to be looking around to figure out what your next move is immediately. I, I loved how that game deviated from the regular Metroid series, helped expand the universe a little bit but also give it kind of an emotional core, uh, which hearken to you know, some of the emotional elements near the end of Super Metroid. Metroid Prime 2 only sold about half as many units as the original Prime, and at the time, Retro Studios were ready to move on from the Metroid franchise. However, Nintendo had different plans in mind, and asked Retro to soldier forward and close out the trilogy with Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Corruption represented yet another major shift in the Prime series and the Metroid franchise overall. As a Wii exclusive title, Corruption featured better graphics than the first two GameCube games, as well as an all new control scheme built around the Wii's motion controls. The added mobility and precision gave Retro even more flexibility with combat design and made simple environmental interactions more immersive. There's a gameplay mechanic in Metroid Prime 3 Corruption where Samus is corrupted by Phazon, which is the substance that the space pirates have been trying to harness to use for its power over the course of those three games. Samus is infected by Phazon. It will kill her if she's not careful. Um, that said, the game gives you the ability to use that Phazon as a weapon. So it's a balancing act of using the Phazon to deal damage and then not using so much Phazon that you kill yourself. I don't remember the specific mission or the moment in the game, but I was just walking along. There were enemies up in front of me. I hadn't even started combat yet. And I just, Samus was corrupted. She just started freaking out and I needed to expel all the Phazon from, the, from her arm cannon in order to save her life. And I remember just freaking out because I wasn't expecting it. So here I am with my Wii Remote and Nunchuck and I'm mashing the A button just desperately trying to get all the Phazon out of her gun. And I didn't do it in time. And that's scary. I don't want to be infected by Phazon and die to some virus that I can't overcome. That's creepy. Makes for a cool set piece, but ugh. Not only did Prime 3 Corruption deepen the immersion, it also expanded the Metroid universe even further than its predecessors. Instead of traversing a single planet, players navigate an entire solar system, visiting multiple planets and space stations with their own unique biomes, interconnected zones, and civilizations to encounter. You even get more control over Samus's ship, using it to clear obstacles, bomb enemies, and haul cargo. Samus also interacts with far more NPCs in Prime 3, including a cast of fellow bounty hunters aiding in the Federation's mission to stop Dark Samus and prevent the spread of Phazon throughout the galaxy. This made Prime 3 one of the most expansive and varied games in the series, but often at the expense of the isolation and exploration fans look for in a Metroid game. Prime 3 still has its moments of suspense, however, 
and in some ways, those moments of tension and isolation are all the more affecting when contrasted against the game's broader scope. Favorite moment in the Metroid series is probably in Metroid Prime 3, when you're at Skytown and you go through a door and then you're walking through you're walking through the the hallways and there are Metroids in these containers. And you just know they're gonna be set free. And then you get to the the end and you open the door and you get the energy cell and you get the second missiles and then everything turns dark. The music changes and the tension is amazing. I love that. I love that, uh, that, that part of the game so much. Prime 3 closed the trilogy out on a high note. It garnered favorable reviews and fans enjoyed the pointer controls so much that they were retrofitted into the Wii ports of Metroid Prime 1 and 2 that appear in the Prime Trilogy collection. Go play Corruption. You haven't. I know you haven't. Go do it. Alongside the core Prime trilogy, Nintendo also released several Prime spin-off games, including Metroid Prime Hunters, an exclusive interquel on the Nintendo DS set between the events of Prime 1 and 2. The DS having a demo for Hunters I thought was really cool, if only because it, it sort of showcased a lot of what the, that console could do. And Nintendo has always been very good about that, right? There have been really specific showcase games for Nintendo consoles, right? Um, obviously Wii Sports is like the, the king of that, but you know, Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild, going back to the N64, you had Super Mario 64. And so I view that Metroid Prime Hunters demo as a showcase for the DS. Oh, Hunters. Metroid Prime Hunters is a weird game. Um, when the DS first came out, I had a rich friend that got one like day one, uh, and it came with that little Hunters demo cart. I remember being fascinated with it because I never had a GBA, right? So I went from Game Boy Color to eventually I bought a PSP. Seeing Hunters on the DS was, I think, probably my first time seeing like a polygonal 3D first person game on a portable system. So like that was fascinating and seeing something that felt so accurately Metroid-y in there was also fascinating. It is a little bit light on the kind of like level design as a series of puzzle boxes within puzzle boxes that you kind of get from the Prime games in general uh, and a bit more about more or less solving individual rooms um, repeatedly every time you enter them. Uh, and the first person platforming became a little bit more janky. They did a little bit less of the jumping flash, like head bob down thing that Prime does uh, when you like double jump and stuff. Um, so it's just a little bit harder to navigate in general. Um, but I think the translation of the visual aesthetic to a comparatively much more simplified platform was and is still really, really interesting to me. Um, the way that they took the art direction of Prime and applied it to something that's like, I don't know, roughly on par with an N64, kind of. Yeah, I don't know. It, it feels a lot more to me like a lot of the early like PS1 FPSs in a way, because it is more heavily leaning on the combat than the exploration, I think. It's just super interesting to like deconstruct and study um, as an exercise in translating both aesthetic and art direction and the graphics as well as just like design ethos to a platform that is smaller less technologically capable and inherently portable which means redesigning things to work on like commutes and stuff metroid prime's popularity also spawned a novel spin-off title that few fans probably saw coming metroid prime pinball <laughs> <laughs> this is a legitimately good game it's still a fun and solid metroid game uh, and pinball game. I think Metroid Prime Pinball just really has a fun time adapting the events of Metroid Prime 1, but into the form of a pinball table. And it takes a lot of those elements that you kind of look for in a good pinball table, that's sort of like adapting like little set pieces and everything, you know, all the little recognizable beats that you remember from the main package, uh, but adapted into, you know, a ball just hopping around and uh, running into bumpers and everything like that. But they also find a way to incorporate elements that take advantage of the fact that it is a video game. Uh, you know, they do certain things uh, with it, with that format that you couldn't do on an actual pinball table. It just works. The Morph Ball, it's a pinball and you can 
come out of the said morph ball and attack enemies while you're on the field and I have it right here it had a rumble pack this game has a rumble pack and it it's it, it still works I think I'm gonna turn this on right now see even right now I'm a you can't see this but I'm a morph ball and uh, there's space pirates flying around everywhere you have to defeat them and that interactivity just makes it feel a little bit more special and I think it's probably one of the best pinball games I've played that's based on another video game. I, I mean, I like it more than Sonic Spinball, if that tells you anything. Metroid Prime Pinball is an incredibly underrated game that I would love to see a sequel to, especially if they go the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games route and do a team up of Metroid Prime and Sonic Spinball. I think Metroid Prime Pinball is a good game. <laughs> By 2009, Metroid's future felt uncertain. While Prime 3's final end credit sequence left the door open for possible sequels, Prime 2 and 3 didn't sell nearly as well as the first, and it was clear the story of Dark Samus and Phazon was over for now. And though Metroid Fusion wasn't a conclusive ending to Samus' story, there were no obvious lingering plot threads for new games to follow either. So when Reggie fils introduced Metroid Other M at E3 2009, Fans were relieved to see Samus back in action, and first impressions were positive. The reveal trailer showed Metroid from yet another perspective, third-person 3D. Samus looked more acrobatic, brutalizing enemies in a mix of ranged and melee combat. The art direction, music, and general atmosphere seemed on point too, and the reveal that Yoshio Sakamoto was once again back as the writer and co-director producer, and working with the action game veterans Team Ninja, best known for the Ninja Gaiden series, only raised fan expectations. The game's marketing went even further, hyping Other M up as the next step in the 2D Metroid series and promised to fill in important story details that took place between Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion. I didn't really get into the franchise until Metroid Other M was being marketed. I started seeing trailers and everything come out about that, and there were some in particular that were delving into the history of the franchise, and I just knew that I needed to know more. I knew that I wanted to experience those adventures for myself. Of course, we all know what happened next. The game launched to mixed reviews and poor fan reception. Reactions to Other M's combat were varied at best, and the story was almost universally panned. However, it would be unfair to say Metroid Other M offered nothing to the series. One thing I don't think you can deny about Metroid Other M is the CG animation. They, the developers were so confident about the animation that they created that they added a mode where you could watch the entire thing as a movie in the game. We never get Samus's perspective on anything that happens. And I think that's something that Other M does really well, even if some people don't like the way Samus is characterized. One moment in the game that gets criticized a lot is Samus versus the reborn, cloned, reincarnated, whatever you want to call it, Ridley. And when she sees Ridley for the first time in that moment, uh, you see a scene of her as a little girl crying, and you see fear in her eyes. And so many people dislike that, that Samus would show vulnerability at all. But when you think about it, Ridley killed her parents when she was a little girl. And if she witnessed that, that's going to be a traumatic experience for anybody. So for, for whatever you think about Samus as a badass bounty hunter or whatever, she's a human and she's got human emotions. I think anyone would have been shut down in a moment like that. So when people think that Samus should be this lifeless badass, you gotta give her a little more than that. She's a person. If I could give the game credit in any way, it would be how cool the CG animation is and attempting to humanize Samus, even if it didn't always work out. Other M's attempts at deepening Samus's character and presenting her as a capable melee combatant may not have worked out as Sakamoto had hoped. But these ideas would go on to directly inspire some of the best games in the series going forward. Sadly, fans wouldn't get to experience those for several more years, as Nintendo once again, predictably, shelved the series following Other M's poor reception. And at the time, it felt like Metroid was done for good. 
Six years later, Metroid finally resurfaced yet again, this time with another spinoff titled Metroid Prime Federation Force. Like Metroid Prime Hunters, Federation Force was a multiplayer focused first person shooter, but instead of Samus and the Bounty Hunter rivals, players controlled a squad of Federation soldiers. All appearances by Samus were as an NPC in the main campaign. Truthfully, Federation Force isn't a bad game. In fact, it's pretty good if you can find a few friends to play it with. I had some co-workers with 3DSs who wanted to play through Triforce Heroes together, and afterwards we followed it with Federation Force, and it was honestly a pretty fun time. I think the main reason for all the blowback against Federation Force is that Nintendo went cute with it. You know, I think they were trying to appeal to the Triforce Heroes crowd, but the problem is that Metroid traditionally is the not cute Nintendo game. You know, it's the one single solitary Nintendo series that is allowed to be not cute. Uh, people enjoy the occasional cute Samus cameo, but I don't think anyone wanted a cute Metroid game. Below background Federation Force stems from it being a thing that was Metroid Prime adjacent in an age where people were really clambering for a new like Metroid ass Metroid game. Um, granted, I think a, roughly 1% of 1% of those people has actually even played through the entire trilogy, but that's neither here nor there. As the first Metroid title since the ill-fated Other M, Federation Force left fans and critics disappointed. In hindsight, it's clear Federation Force was not some sort of thoughtless insult to Metroid fans, but rather Nintendo taking its first cautious step towards a new era for the series. As just one year later at E3 2017, Nintendo announced Metroid Prime 4 was officially in development from Bandai Namco. Not only that, but the 2D series was set to return as well with a remake of Metroid 2 on the Nintendo 3DS titled Metroid Samus Returns. Yoshio Sakamoto returned once again as producer for Samus Returns. However, development would be handled by a third-party studio, Mercury Steam. At the time, Mercury Steam was best known for the Castlevania Lords of Shadow trilogy, a polarizing reboot and reimagining of the Castlevania series, and one that Castlevania fans were pretty mixed on. And with Other M and Federation Force still fresh in the minds of many Metroid fans, not to mention a controversial DMC takedown of a beloved Metroid 2 fan remake called AM2R, it's fair to say some folks were skeptical Samus Returns would be a true return to form. Luckily for us, it was excellent. Okay, that's like picking a favorite child, <laughs> honestly. Picking a favorite Metroid, man. Uh, you know, that... 3DS remake of Samus Returns might be it simply because it is a remake of the first one I ever played so I think it hits on that nostalgia factor for me yeah I don't know picking a favorite's impossible why do you do this to me Brendan <laughs> but probably Samus Returns one thing I really want to shout out about Samus Returns is just the sense of scale that you get from this tiny little 3DS screen Using that 3D slider, it makes everything on SR3D8, even though you're underground in these caverns and caves and whatnot, everything feels massive. With that added 3D effect, it just feels like the backgrounds of these areas go on for hundreds of feet or even miles at times. You know, there's giant underground lakes, there's huge subterranean structures. It's such a cool effect and it really adds to the atmosphere of this game you know I, I know a lot of people really hope that it comes to the switch and i do too but i think that playing it on the 3ds with 3d on i don't know it's just it feels like the right way to play this game and uh yeah it, it to this day it's one of my favorite metroid experiences samus returns wasn't a perfect game notably it does lose the claustrophobic atmosphere and darker themes of metroid 2 on game boy that's part of why I and many others still think the original Metroid 2 is worth playing. But Samus Returns still stands as an excellent entry in the series on its own merits. Besides, Samus Returns' importance is less about whether it's a suitable replacement for Metroid 2 or even AM2R, and more about how it unifies the Metroid series overall. 
Not only was Samus Returns the first 2D Metroid in 13 years, but its art direction, soundtrack, and atmosphere were inspired by Metroid Prime. It even features new story elements that canonically bridge the Prime trilogy and the 2D series for the first time. Samus' new melee abilities and finishing moves were also inspired by Other M's acrobatic combat animations. And while Samus' characterization is drastically different than Other M's, having a more expressive Samus would have been impossible without Other M's precedent. On top of all of that, Samus Returns even foreshadows the events of Metroid Fusion, and all of these elements add more narrative cohesion to the series that wouldn't have existed without Samus Returns. But perhaps best of all, the final ending of Samus Returns hinted at something Metroid fans were longing for, something entirely new. Following Samus Returns and the announcement of Metroid Prime 4, Metroid fans were going into every Nintendo Direct with high expectations especially E3 2021. Just two years prior, in 2019, Nintendo announced it had scrapped Bandai Namco's Metroid Prime 4 and was restarting the project with Metroid Prime's original development studio, Retro Studios, albeit with an entirely new team made up of new developers, seeing as how most of Metroid Prime's staff had moved on to other studios or left the game's industry entirely. Since then, fans had eagerly awaited more information about Prime 4's development. Additionally, Rumors now circulated that Mercury Steam was working on yet another 2D Metroid game, potentially even a remake of the beloved Super Metroid. Well, at the 2021 E3 Direct, we finally got our answers. Yeah, that was nuts. Just seeing that like logo come up of Dread, the people who knew were like, oh, you know, cause Dread, you know, had been leaked or announced or something like that, like 19 years prior. And then it just never materialized. So see, just seeing Dread was like, Wah. and then seeing the way it looked and that it was, you know, awesome. Just that announcement, I cried, I, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was nuts. Metroid Dread's announcement was monumental for a few reasons. Not only were we getting another new 2D Metroid, it was Metroid 5, and it was finally furthering the story for the first time since 2002's Metroid Fusion. It was also the fulfillment of a decades-long rumor that started with a cheeky pirate log scan in Metroid Prime 3, proclaiming that Metroid Dread was nearing completion. Best of all, it was only a few months away. While it was clear we wouldn't be seeing anything of Metroid Prime 4 for a while, Metroid Dread easily made up for the delay. It is really difficult for me to choose a favorite out of this series. Metroid Prime 1 and Super Metroid are tied really, really close to each other, but there's one game that came out that I think takes a lot of what I love from, from both, and that would probably be Metroid Dread. I absolutely love Metroid Dread, and after sitting on it for a little bit, it's possibly my favorite game in the Metroid franchise. Metroid Dread does something that I think Fusion kind of struggled with. Metroid Fusion would often just give you these big pointers of where to go on your map, like this big dot saying go here, and Metroid Dread doesn't do that. It's still linear. It often masks its linearity. It never tells you where to go. In fact, sometimes you're meant to go in an entirely different section of the world. However, there was never a moment where I was like, oh, what am I supposed to do here? Because the game design and its level design just kind of leads you the right way without you even realizing. It will divide one kind of, you know, level, so to speak, into two or three sections that are accessible from different other places on the map, um, which led to me running around a whole lot and having a lot of fun finding other ways to get to those areas and trying to keep mental notes and maps of what things are getting progress and what places, which the actual in-game map does a really good job of uh, notating a lot of that stuff for you as well. Of course, there's also like speed running routes and special paths through. So I think it's kind of brilliant that that game was built in a way where you could never actually get stuck. I think that the, the most important thing about Dread that Nintendo absolutely nailed is the gameplay loop of like, okay, I found a new item. I'm gonna go explore. I'm gonna use the item. It was kind of like, okay, go into a new space, uh, fight the enemy, get the thing, and then spend the next couple hours just like running around and jumping on stuff. And the highest uh, moral calling for video game design is to facilitate running around and jumping on stuff. So that's... <laughs> the Emmys, E-M-M-I, the robot things that chase you around, 
I think are really interesting and I understand why people don't like them because they're insta kills or whatever but when you figure out how they work and how to counter them and stuff it's really cool and just that that area the way it looks when you're in an emmy zone there's like a filter over top and it just is extra dreadful if you will and some of the bosses in this game too are magical i, I kind of wish that kraid wasn't shown off by nintendo themselves because that moment where you stumble into kraid's chamber and you see him chained up it's it just feels like the justice that kraid never really got it's always been about Ridley, but Kraid hadn't been in a game, really, since Super Metroid, and it was so cool to see him back. I like Raven Beak for being a bit more of a traditional story villain, you know, kind of a bit of an overarching, pulling the strings sort of villain. I think in terms of just a world that you freely navigate, Super Metroid Zebus is probably my favorite, but Metroid Dread is so visceral and cool. Like, Samus has never been as cool as she is in Dread. They've nailed her character. Another favorite moment for me has got to be uh, Samus's one line of dialogue in uh, Metroid Dread. There's something so powerful about keeping her as a silent protagonist until this one specific moment, and she delivers one line with, you know, that fanfare music starting up in the background. <laughs> It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, and longtime Metroid fans really understood and were seen in that moment. I typically am not like somebody who gets really invested in video game stories, but seeing how Nintendo continued the story from the previous games into Dread, I thought was really interesting. But the ending was just like, whoa! After a really intense, but I think really fun boss fight in your Darth Vader bird dad, uh, Samus is on the brink of death, but in a very sort of, you know, shonen anime-esque transformation, she gets this garish green outfit that uh, is just like the apex of her power. This leaves Samus as effectively being the last Metroid, which I think is a good kind of narrative play on Super Metroid, you know, the galaxy is at peace, the last Metroid in captivity. And while this is all happening, you know, Samus is usually not of the talkative sort, very quiet, almost never speaks, but she is screaming at the top of her lungs. I'm still hearing those screams in my head. It was such a cool climactic fight. Red is just a very special game that I wish everyone would play. It's just so much fun, and I think that it capitalizes on a lot of the storytelling and gameplay potential that has been set forth decades prior and just really goes full throttle with it. And I think that Mercury Steam really took a lot of lessons that it learned from Samus Returns and helped tune it into something truly unique and special to this series. Not only was Metroid Dread a critical success and wildly popular with diehard fans, it also smashed Metroid sales records to become the best selling game in the series so far. Unsurprisingly, rumors imply the team is already working on a follow up meaning this time we may not have to wait 19 years to see Samus's next 2D adventure. So I had actually completed all the interviews for this documentary by the time that Metroid Prime Remastered was announced and Shadow Dropped on the same day. So. Of course, no one really got to share their opinions on this new remaster. But uh, fortunately for me, that gives me an opportunity to actually talk about my favorite game of all time in this video. And this remaster is by far the best version of it that exists. Most importantly, the game plays pretty much identically to the GameCube and Wii versions, depending on which control style you use. And there's the new inclusion of the dual analog stick controls, which I think work pretty well. Um, I am a fan of the GameCube original controls, but I will admit I played through the whole game with the dual analog sticks and I thought it felt great. Um, it didn't really change that much from the, uh, you know, the core Metroid Prime gameplay experience the way I kind of thought it might. Then of course, there's the graphics. And I could do an entire video just talking about how much I love the way this game looks. The atmospheric effects, the fog and the, the water, the lighting, everything just adds so much more atmosphere to a game that was already one of the most atmospherically dense games ever made. It just makes Talon 4 feel like such a, a real place. It adds a, a verisimilitude to the entire setting that 
man, a few games, Metroid or otherwise, really ever accomplish. And if nothing else, we now have an amazing version of Metroid Prime we can play on modern platforms, and you know what? That alone is something worth celebrating. It takes a lot for a series to last almost four decades, especially one that has faced as many setbacks as Metroid. Video games have changed drastically since Metroid debuted in 1987, and not many series have survived this chaotic industry. Nevertheless, Samus has endured, and she remains an important part of the medium's history. In fact, some of the massive shifts in how and why games are made were sparked by the Metroid franchise's constant innovations. More importantly, many Metroid games are regarded as timeless classics that players return to over and over again. But that raises the question, what makes Metroid games so uniquely compelling? And how are they able to invite repeat playthroughs even after you've memorized every secret hidden across these alien worlds? The most important factor of a Metroid game is exploration. That has to be the number one thing. Everything should support that. You're not being told where to go, but you're being lightly pushed. The game doesn't hold your hand, but it doesn't feed you to the wolves either. Being lost is kind of part of the experience. You want to use your own intuition and feel like you know what you're doing yourself without being led down a path or having a marker saying, hey, go here. It's just so good when you've been lost for like 10 minutes or even half an hour or an hour. Eventually you stumble upon the path yourself. It really does make you feel great. Seeing those doors or seeing those pathways and wondering like, how do I get there? What, what do I need to access these areas? What do I need to access these paths? And when those things start clicking, uh, that's what makes a Metroid game really great. Oh, I can go unlock this other thing now, or I can access this thing I couldn't before with this skill I have. Uh, it, it makes you want to explore more, and it encourages your exploration and rewards you for it. The looking at a wall and being like, that's kind of suspicious. I bet there's something I could do to, you know, uh, make one of those blocks disappear somehow and roll up into a little ball and find myself in a fun, exciting new space. Um, which doesn't really have anything in it other than a small item upgrade that's just there to like wink wink nudge nudge like a Korok seed in Breath of the Wild which is like it's literally only there to be like hey we see you. I think that in order for a Metroid game to be what I want it to be it needs to be a very personal experience and it needs you to kind of make you look inward. I think that there is this really important intimacy that is built between the game and the player. How familiar they become with the world, with where certain enemies are, with certain events and locations and everything like that. And how they work around those, manipulate those, or, you know, just kind of learn to, to uh, maneuver around them, that sort of thing. Just look at the speedrunning community. Uh, or just the people that love being set in there, taking their time and just taking it all in. That intimacy plays out in different ways for different players, but I think it's equally important to every playstyle for the Metroid series. Like to me, that's the that's the biggest uh, thing about Metroid that makes it so fascinating to play through is feeling like you're in a place that you shouldn't be in, aren't supposed to be in, aren't welcome in, but you're stuck there. And you kind of need to um, find yourself existing in every corner of that space at one point or another um, to be able to get everything that you need out of it um, but also just to kind of internalize all of that. It has a very sort of lonely feeling that you don't tend to get from other games in the genre, at least not a lot of them. That loneliness and isolation and kind of haunted feel of exploring uh, an alien world and just sort of Samus against the world and in turn the player against the world, which I find really compelling. There's always this like underlying sort of sense of like discomfort I feel like in the in the Metroid games and that really really it works well especially given the theme of like okay you're exploring this spaceship or a planet and you don't know you know, like you're not from that planet like who knows what could happen I think that makes sense. A lot of Metroidvania games are about exploration right your Castlevanias aren't necessarily about surviving in the castle they're about opening up new parts of the castle. And yeah, you're going to confront Dracula, you're going to fight monsters along the way. But Metroid specifically 
is about survival. Like, how many games are literally about, like, like they start with Samus crashing on the planet, you know? Like, they're about making your escape, they're about getting out of there alive, they're about running away, especially in Dread, from, like, really deadly things on these planets. So there's a sense of urgency and survival and really just needing to make it out alive. There's a case to be made that whatever environment Samus ends up being in is itself her enemy and her main goal, like uh, in every Metroid game. Samus f figuring out how to get out of her situation is kind of the common thread. The environment is portrayed as naturally dangerous. It's portrayed as an animal. Like, animals are an animal. They don't necessarily have the morals you do. Um, it has no natural nice state like in a Zelda. Um, just different levels of predator and prey. Um, within an ecosystem the world's samus visits are well thought out and the species samus interacts with are designed for their e ecosystems and the specific game story in mind um but never in a way that interrupts the player i think you could take any aspect of say the the title creature metroid and look at its weaknesses look at its places in the games and how they function in the stories and learn something about how Metroid as a franchise approaches its world design, approaches its creature design, and approaches Samus as well, and the player. Most of the quote-unquote enemies and stuff are not there explicitly to uh, attack you. They're not there as enemies, like, philosophically. They're going to hurt you because you're in their space and are a threat to them. Through. Because you're going to hit them with an ice beam and use them as a platform, basically, is why they're going <laughs> to, why they have a problem with you. Um, they're just off doing their thing. They are being big weird bugs, doing whatever it is big weird bugs do, you know? Um, and that could very well pose a problem for you, but like it's just a thing that you need to be uh, conscious of as you move through the space. The feeling of not knowing what's out there, the, the environment is out to get you as much as the enemies are. Space is creepy. Space is not like Earth. Weird things can happen, things that we don't entirely understand. Uh, a weird bug might come out and blow up in front of your face, or the plants might grab your legs and try to suck you down. Just the kind of player versus nature aspect that comes from Metroid, I think, is what sets it apart. The entire atmosphere around Metroid is uh, surprisingly kind of a horror game, uh, kind of getting lost in this, in this world. You know, it takes a lot of inspiration from Ridley Scott's Alien series. Going as far as to name the villain after Ridley himself, you can't get any more no on the nose than that. A lot of games have tried, but not many games have really nailed the H.R. Giger-esque inspiration behind the art style of a Metroid. The core identity of that series is pulling so much from Alien, uh, obviously, that it's, it's very difficult to separate its identity, I think, entirely from that. Yeah, it's taking the sci-fi aesthetic with like the little vague elements of like kind of body horror-ish stuff. But I think it's just just Nintendo-y enough that it's like kind of got its own kind of spin on an existing aesthetic that you kind of can't really get anywhere else. And only the faintest dash of cheesiness. Yeah. <laughs> I think that as long as it remains mature in tone yes. in comparison... Yes to other Nintendo titles. And as long as it has that ambience, that special kind of spacey, isolated ambience that really makes this series something very distinctive. Yes. Then that will always make a great Metroid game. And of course, very solid gameplay, gotta have great sounds, all the usual standards for a great game, but the isolated feeling. Yeah. That isolated, that sense of dread. Mm -hmm. Music in particular really adds to this. The music that I tend to like from the Metroid games is sort of haunting more than it is upbeat, even though it can be that at times. Uh, turn off the lights, boot up your favorite Metroid game with headphones if you can, and just get sucked into the world for hours. That's something I've done on multiple occasions. The music, the sound design, the graphics, uh, even the story to some degree, all of those factors have to come together to serve the atmosphere, and in turn, the atmosphere will service all the other elements as well. How well it captures you, and how well it just pulls you in, and then how much the 
world around you is uh, servicing your ability or your desire to explore or that adding to that feeling of isolation and peril that is imperative to this franchise and I think that that really has to get nailed down if it's going to be a good Metroid game. Then of course there's Samus herself. Samus's appearance, abilities, and motivations constantly shift throughout the series. She's been a bounty hunter, an explorer, a savior, and a destroyer. She's been a silent protagonist, a narrator, and even a third-party witness. But regardless of how she appears from game to game, she remains the soul of the series. For almost 40 years, every planet players explore, the challenges they overcome, the secrets they discover, they do so as Samus, and the series simply wouldn't be what it is today without her. Samus being a recurring character, it's it's got this weird sort of way to make you care about Samus on a game-to-game -game basis. Samus is sort of going through all of this on her own. You know, there are some emotional beats to it regarding the Metroids, and she's just going through and discovering all these strange places, fighting all these strange monsters, and she really only has herself to rely on as she gets stronger and stronger as the game progresses. Samus is in this, it is about survival, and it is about completing the mission, whatever the mission is. Even if her life is on the line, Samus has always got the end goal in mind. Whatever she set out to do, that's still what she's going to do, even if she's put in impossible odds. In, in a lot of ways, I think the novelty of her being a woman starring in an action game as early as 1986, it kind of brings that sense of gravitas that you know modern characters don't really get, even if they are cool. There is certainly no shortage of cool characters in video games, but she's been put in the work for, you know, 35 years almost. Even today, there's still such a small percentage of games that star female protagonists. Like, there are a lot more games nowadays that let you choose your character's gender, but if you're not given that option because the game is written around a specific character, that character is usually male there are comparatively far fewer games that say, no, you'll play as our protagonist and she's a woman. And when it comes to Nintendo, Samus Aran remains the only female character who has an entire series all to herself. I know, of course, one of the most important aspects, the Morph Ball. Morph Ball is, is almost synonymous with Samus herself, you know? Um, it's like her defining move or dividing characteristic is just turning into a, a weird two foot three foot sphere and just rolling around isn't the morpho like the coolest thing ever it adds a layer of exploration puzzle solving and increased traversal that works so seamlessly with one another even in 3d it works so well it blew my mind the first time i used the spider ball and i was like whoa this is so cool and like just everything around it man did you know that Retro Studios rolled basketballs around to understand how to animate the Morph Ball moving in the, in the Metroid Prime games. That's a free bit of trivia for you right there. Praise, praise the Morph Ball. <laughs> Any discussion of Metroid would be incomplete without mentioning its impact on the video game industry overall. Namely, its role in establishing the Metroidvania subgenre, a style of game where players traverse non-linear, interconnected levels in search of special abilities and keys that unlock new pathways. The term specifically comes from Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which established the formula many other Metroidvanias would follow. And yet, even with all the indie Metroidvanias filling the long gaps between Metroid games, and in some cases even pushing the genre beyond the level of its namesakes, there's something uniquely special about Metroid that its imitators just can't quite match, no matter how hard they try. I think the Metroid series is different from other Metroidvanias, primarily at this stage because of the production value. A lot of the Metroidvania games these days are real indie-like, so they don't have the high production values. That's not to take anything away from them, but you don't see Metroidvania games with, say, the production value of Dread, or even the Prime series, right? I mean, if we're talking about the Prime series, those games alone uh, in a in a league all, all by themselves. There's no other games that play like Metroid, the Metroid Prime games. 
there's, there's games that probably include elements. I mean, if you play Doom 2016, you can see elements of Metroid Prime in there, but the Metroid Prime games uh, are their own thing, and there's nothing like them. So many Metroidvanias are more inspired by the Castlevania side of things now. They have RPG elements, or they're trying to be Souls-like. Uh, Metroid is just very pure in you get more powerful through exploring, and when you get an upgrade, it's a functional upgrade, not a statistical upgrade like it can be in many other games. I think part of it is the legacy. It's endured for so long, and uh, it has not only helped establish a whole entire genre, but it's continued to show that, in my opinion, with games like Metroid Dread, it still does it the best. I love Castlevania, I love the Ori series, I love uh, Hollow Knight. I think what makes Metroid sort of the gold standard is it did it first and it did it the best and it continues to do it the best. You know, um, you can have great combat, you can have great map design, you can have, you know, challenging uh, boss fights and things like that, but nobody does it quite like Metroid. And I think the most recent Metroid is a great example of this. You know, it's not this groundbreaking new take on the genre, but it does introduce little things like the Emmys um, that add something new to that tried and true formula and really kind of prove why Nintendo is the best at, at making these sorts of games. We don't get Metroid games very often. And for a Nintendo first party franchise, uh, there's not nearly as many Metroid games as there are Mario games and Zelda games and all the other ones that, you know, we seem to get annually or maybe every two to three years. Getting a Metroid game is a big deal. And when we finally get one, you know, people are, they can't wait. So I think having Metroid games kind of here and there, because again, like Castlevania is a huge franchise and there's tons of games. They seem to kind of uh, fill in maybe the years where we don't have Metroid games. There's other games that seem to fill in those spots because people seem to want them so bad that they'll go make their own, you know, or they'll find something that inspired them and kind of put out other games that clearly were, you know, created by people who grew up loving this franchise. The Metroid series has had a long history, and for many years, that's all Metroid really had. It's past. For the first time in a long time, it feels like Samus has a future. Which leads to one final question. Where does the Metroid series go from here? Where do I hope the series goes next? Now that's an interesting question. During the lull, where there weren't that many Metroid games, the indie scene exploded with so many Metroidvanias, Metroid-likes, search actions, whatever you want to call them. And I think it's got to the point where if they just kept doing standard Metroids, I'd enjoy them, I'd love them. But it wouldn't be doing anything new, and I think what made Metroid so popular in the first place is that it was innovating. It was taking these new gameplay concepts and refining them to the point where it was pretty much perfect in Super Metroid, and then redefined itself again in Metroid Prime. And I kind of want a series to keep doing that. I think all Metroid Prime 4 needs to do is be another Metroid Prime. But after that, we, we've had the rebirth of 2D Metroid with Dread. We're getting the rebirth of 3D Metroid with Prime. I think they really need to try something new after that, whether it's a third-person game, not quite like Other M, but a third-person exploration game along the lines of Prime with a new perspective. Like maybe a Returnal-style game, something where uh, Samus drops into a planet, and it's not so much a giant open world, but you know, maybe something you can explore in a different dimension, a different way. The way that Metroid Prime uh, did everything in first person, maybe have a third-person Samus game. Uh, I think it'd be kind of interesting and it would be the Nintendo franchise that could do it, you know? I think what they did with Prime is sort of a great example of what I want to see next in that it still has the heart and soul of what makes the series Metroid, but with a totally new feature that, you know, flips it on its head. So like in Prime, obviously it's first person, that was huge. That still is like really cool that they did that even, you know, 20 years later or however long ago it was. One thing I keep thinking of is like, what if it were like really realistic looking? Um, that could be really cool. Like just still feel, you know, very Metroid, um, but with like a, a different coat of paint, I guess. I think that could really work, um, but still super like 
uh, Metroidvania E, where you're, you know, there's not, they don't give you a lot of information and you're just sort of encouraged to explore. Yeah, especially if there is a Prime 4 happening anytime soon. I would, I would love to see that game just get deep in the weeds with like just dumb system stuff that like whether they ask you to interact with that stuff as a player directly or not, like just, all right, we're going to go Galaxy Brain here. Star Wars Republic Commando, when you shoot a bug and it gets guts all over your face and then the screen, like the visor, like wipes it off electronically, do that, but take the thing from Metro where there's a dedicated button to wipe your visor clean and do it manually. And then you have a perfect video game. What more do you need? That's a good point though. What if Metroid was Thief is a really good idea. So really just need Deus Ex in like a cool like exosuit in space, right? That, yeah. <laughs> We're getting Metroid Prime 4, right? So that's where the series is going next. But as far as what that entails, I think a lot of folks are just going to be happy to see a return to that 3D take of Metroid. But honestly, you know, we've seen the... To... to, to use a colloquial term we've seen like the breath of the wild style mario game with mario odyssey obviously zelda was that we saw that with dark souls when we got elden ring right and so i'm kind of curious what that sort of zero hand holding big wide open expanse to explore could mean for metroid because you still need those gated areas you still need all those secrets but to do that in sort of wider hubs, as opposed to smaller biomes that are more about individual rooms and tunnels and paths like that, I'd be really curious to see what that is. I'd like to see a vast and wide, expansive Metroid game. Not necessarily like your typical open world Breath of the Wild type of thing, but something just far bigger in scale with a lot of secrets and not obvious secrets, like really hidden stuff. I can see four going to more of a, a sort of open world. Not so much like Breath of the Wild, for instance, maybe like a Sony game. Like think of a uh, God of War or its sequel, or even The Last of Us Part Two in that one section in Seattle, for instance. If they do something like that for Metroid Prime, I think that could be really interesting. As far as 2D Metroid goes, the only thing I want from a 2D Metroid is that we don't wait so long for the next one. You know, we get it on this drip feed where it goes dormant for many years and then it comes back. And I think that that idea of uh, gone but not forgotten is really works in its favor because a lot of the Metroid games do the same things in, in the same ways, um, but just presented a little bit differently. And when you have that lapse in time, uh, it really can work in a way that shouldn't you know like finding the missiles and opening up new paths works in every single metroid game um i don't really think that they have a formula that they need to fix or improve upon because those games are really perfect i think what i would like for the series to continue to do is set the gold standard for metroidvanias i think taking a look at an example like metroid dread borrowing concepts or ideas from recent successful metroidvanias and incorporating that into the metroid formula is really brilliant um i think that that in terms of what i would want next from a metroid game it it's kind of embarrassing to say but i just i just want more metroid i just want more of the same um if they can continue to cherry pick some of the best from uh other parts of the genre and implement that into the game. I think that that's, that's what makes Metroid great, you know, um, building on the foundation that's already there, but introducing these new concepts in a way that makes sense for the series. I would love to see an indie developer tackle the Metroid series in a sort of completely new direction. We saw this to great success, I think, with Cadence of Hyrule a few years back. I think if we had Motion Twin, the people behind Dead Cells tackle the Metroid series in a sort of roguelike fashion as well. I think they could do something really new and interesting with the franchise. In terms of where I hope the series goes next, I kind of hope that it does a bit of a back to basics things. 
um, you know, less cutscenes, less dialogue, and more just like really getting into the gameplay. Um, I have liked the super smooth gameplay uh, introduced in Metroid Dread, but I'd loved if they sort of scaled back the storytelling and things and just made you uh, really engrossed in the game and not, you know, doesn't take you out of it in any way. Just again, feeling like it's Samus on this alien world that you have to explore and discover and conquer on your own rather than having to spend too much time talking or you know having too much story um, sort of exposition wise thrown at you. I think that would be really great if it went back to a sort of Super Metroid kind of style just with you know beautiful smooth modern controls. I think there's a future for Metroid in 3D as much as there is in 2D. It's proven itself that it can sustain its integrity and identity as two extremely different gameplay structures, being a 2D side-scroller and a first-person shooter. Uh, you can't say that about many franchises, and I think that's what makes Metroid even more fascinating. I think the plot is where it starts getting tricky because Fusion and Dread kind of set forth some events that you can't really go back from, but they did also kind of help build up the Galactic Federation as a possible threat. And I would really like to see that explored. They're only becoming more powerful in this universe the more successful that Samus has been in dispatching other, other threats. And so I think it would be cool if instead of going to different planets and seeing, you know, the Federation failed at like, you know, colonizing or researching certain locations, maybe you're trying to stop them from going there or from tampering with forces they shouldn't be messing with, that sort of thing. I think it would be really interesting just seeing Samus tackle a threat that she used to work alongside with. What I would hope the series does in the future is retain some of the horror elements it started to run with in Fusion and Dread. Um, I think the most interesting thread I always get from this series is it's much more cynical about forces of authority and actors in the world. I think involving the Galactic Federation more could be neat. We saw a little bit of that with Metroid Prime Hunters and Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Um, I still want Samus to be alone, but I think it'd be neat if she was at odds with the Galactic Federation in some way. She has her roots in the Galactic Federation as we saw in Metroid Other M. Um, she obviously doesn't feel very great about those years. Um, so I'd just like to see where they could take that. Samus has already fought the unknown enemy and I'd be really cool if now she fought the known enemy. I think there's a lot you can do with Metroid that hasn't been done before. Uh, I'm not as smart as as the developers behind the series. I couldn't give you a billion suggestions for where they could go. But I think um, what I really want is what I don't know I want. And that's the most exciting thing about this, this industry, is we're often given things that we have no idea that we desired, and that becomes our new desire. There are so many directions Nintendo could take Metroid in the future. We don't know what Metroid Prime 4 will be, and we don't know what follows Dread. But the important part is that Metroid has a future. That hasn't always been certain throughout the series' history. At the very least, Metroid fans can be at peace knowing that we have not yet seen the last of Metroid.